partnership with the Whitney Biennial 2012. And um, along with a, a further presentation on Tuesday evening next week by um, artist Georgia Sagri, um, it, this kind of event constitutes the third of three, what we're calling symposia, over the last six weeks that have um, addressed specific themes in response to the Biennial. So this particular series of talks is titled uh, Form an Institution and takes as its starting point the, the allocation of the four floor galleries at the Whitney Biennial as a performance space, music, dance, theatre and participatory programming. So the talks this evening and on Tuesday will in different ways approach questions around the status of performance within the particular public sphere of the art museum or institution and the manner in which a turn, particular turn towards temporality, public rehearsals and transitory audience spectatorship represents both formal and political shifts. So we're very pleased tonight to be joined by uh, Shannon Jackson, David Velasco and Sarah Mitchelson um, who we've invited tonight to speak around this subject um, and specifically with Sarah to speak with David about her project in the Biennial. Um, Shannon Jackson is Distinguished Professor in the Arts and Humanities at University of California, Berkeley and Director of the Arts Research Center. Her recent publications include Social Works, Performing Arts, Supporting Publics and Professing Performance. David Velasco is editor of ArtForum.com and a regular contributor to ArtForum. Um, his particular contribution to the May issue of the magazine was um, a very interesting and, and, and a kind of review that we will touch on tonight a bit further, I think, of the performance program in the Whitney Biennial this year. And Sarah Mitchelson um, is a choreographer whose work, Devotional Study No. 1, The American Dancer, features um, on the fourth floor of the Biennial in early March. Her work has previously been featured at The Kitchen in New York and the Walker Art Center in Minneapolis, amongst numerous other venues. So the format um, for this evening is we're going to begin with uh, a presentation from Shannon, um, titled The Way We Perform Now, followed by um, a talk from David that will lead into a conversation with Sarah. So we're going to ask that you um, retain questions from Shannon's talk um, to the end of um, David and Sarah's conversation at which time we'll kind of regather and have an opportunity for questions from the audience and discussion amongst the participants. So I'm going to hand over now to Shannon, and thank you all for coming. Thank you very much, Richard. And um, thank you for coming. Uh, I uh, told Richard that I was thoughts around this uh, title, The Way We Perform Now, in part because I wanted to unpack some of the terms in that title, The Way We Perform Now. So I'm going to do that first. And then I'm going to also try to sort of uh, survey uh, a lot of the thinking, puzzles, and sort of occupational hazards around this conjunction across the arts that we're talking about here. A lot of people in this room have been doing a lot of great work and thinking, and so I kind of wanted to think about maybe sort of taking a collective audit of how we think about how we perform now. Um, I'm also, this is also brand new, so I'm just very committed to the text and we'll have to read it. And also, it's, I'm not very, um, I don't have any real precious attachment to anything I'm saying either, so please uh, feel free to debate. Some first thoughts. So, let's see if I can get my radius working better. Okay, so the way we perform now, to begin, the way invokes larger and I guess broader questions of medium, technique, skill, material, as they interface with different conceptions of duration, spectacle, amateurism, virtuosity, conceptualism, experience, pleasure, and rigor. These various ways of making art and culture also interact with different conceptions of what we think that the way used to be. Did the way used to mean making objects in a studio, or did it mean the making of dance movement in a different kind of studio? Did the way used to mean creating commodity art for the selling to selling of collectors, or was the way or did the way refer to the rehearsing of ticketed plays for subscriber audiences? Does the way it used to be, what did it used to be, say, public plop art, um, 
sorry if people love that sculpture, I didn't know nothing to do with that one, or um, as it has been some, to some degree not exactly replaced, but at least dispersed by a variety of performative practices, and this is the shameless plug portion of the evening. Those different notions of the way might obviously expose vastly different notions of who the we might be, based again on who you think that the we once was and whether you think you were ever part of it. Is the we former art school students, people for whom performance inhabited a side pursuit in an under-resourced studio where one experimented with liberating oneself from the object before returning to proper object making, making in the better resourced studios of the rest of the art school? Is the we former theater students, people for whom performance meant accessing the diaphragm, learning scansion, developing emotion memory, and experimenting with all varieties of objectives and obstacles to create believable characters? Is the we former dance students, those, perched, um, those who perched limbs atop bars and bodies before mirrors, submitting themselves to Balanchinian discipline so that you could produce feats of virtuosic excellence that made it look like you weren't suffering, only to realize that over there, in another studio or another gallery, under some different artist signatures or a PS1, the frank exposure of suffering and performance had become an aesthetic long before. Perhaps the we is a set of museum curators, those trained in a wide and varied set of rigorous visual art histories, those who navigate the turmoil of setting up an exhibition while being responsive to an artist's bidding, those who now find themselves cajoled and sometimes pressured to install performance-based activity whose precedence and purpose remain equivocal in a museum context, hurtling ever more toward what this program's announcement called the experience of totalizing social production how the event tonight was advertised. Perhaps the we is the group of performance curators who have been making performance happen for a while. The Philip Bythers, the Bill Bissells, the Peter Taubes, who might see themselves in a longer lineage of performance enabl enablers. The descendants of the Gertrude Lippincotts at the Walker Art Center, who used to be called, and sometimes still are called, performance coordinators, engagement specialists, dance schedulers at the museum. Even though they might be called something like artistic directors at places like Dance Space, The Kitchen, The Public, Met Opera, or the Philharmonic. If you descend from the longer and varied history of that we, it can be odd and defamiliarizing to learn that the art forms your performing institutions have historically supported are those now associated with the experience of totalizing social production. Conversely, though, you may also have a more sanguine reaction to the news that so many museums only now want to make themselves performance ready. Finally, is the we the receiver of the performance now? The one who thought of herself as a beholder at one venue and an audience member at another? The one who sat in rows in the theater and who roamed in four second per work intervals in the museum? The one who's now struggling to figure out the terms of her engagement with hybrid work now. She finds herself propping her back against a gallery wall or muscling in on the lone bench, struggling to catch a glimpse of a gesture only barely seeable across the museum gallery floor. When she goes to the theater, that same person now finds herself asked to get up out of her comfortable seat um, in order to roam, to circle sculptural objects that used to be called sets or even more disconcertingly told to participate or to interact with them. For the we that is an art receiver, what art literacies and art habits were functionally suspended in some places and reactivated in others, what literacies and habits now seem to need complete recalibration with every newly encountered work. Okay, and what do we make of that word perform, or even what we make of what it means to perform now, which sounds so menacingly familiar as a directive and a command, this 21st century compulsion, perform now. It sounds like a marketing campaign for a, an investment firm, or a luxury car, perform now, or a high-end laser printer. On the one hand, the way we perform now can be recalled as something that's not so different from some of the ways that some members of this we performed then. 
This is hardly the first era that has seen performance in a museum, including, as David Velasco and Claudio LaRocco have said as well, hardly the first time it has happened at the Whitney. But we even might want to counter the presentism of the performance now by reminding us of the then. Um, um, but I do still think it's worth speculating on whether we think there is some difference to this now. Why is the conversation about performing institutions and say virtuosity, another key word used in the program today, in this now, happening with a different kind of urgency or a different inflection than it had at various moments of moments of performance past? Certainly one answer to the question has to do, I think, with that threat of the experience of totalizing social production. And this is a reminder um, of how um, the event was um, contextualized for today. And the fact that the compulsion to perform now is such a ubiquitous marketing campaign. Because artist space used this language and is worrying, as we'll see here, and wondering about the role of activity without end product, it seems to me that this is a venue that has been thinking, too, about contemporary theories of immaterial and affective labor. So I thought I might address some aspects of that conceptual question only briefly, if that's not of interest to, to many. But indeed, in what philosophers such as Antonio Negri, Michael Hard, Maurizio Lazzarato, Paolo Verno, and others call a post-Fordist service economy, labor spheres, both aesthetic and otherwise, are told to perform. That is, to reorient and retrain their labor to provide experience, services, and affective relations in a pri as a primary product. We hear now about the necessity of creating so-called immaterial encounters as key to success in a globalized labor, labor sphere, one that has supposedly transitioned away from the industrial, the so-called Fordist model of material, object-based commodity making. We might all be, I think, as we should be, suspicious of any celebration of a generalized immateriality that represses the material labor of sweatshops, call centers, and fox cons that produce our immaterial experiences. Indeed, one function of some contemporary per performance might actually be to remind us of the performing bodies who, like Nicole Manorino, whose sweat-drenched costume receives so much chronicling, do the physical labor and material work that produces immaterial experiences for their receiver consumers. But while being suspicious of the newness of the comprehensiveness of the immaterial turn, it's hard not to notice that the pressure to perform now in the museum is an index of a more pervasive social and cultural pressure. When I think my slides went way out of order, so I'm just going to see. When MoMA director Glenn Lowry um, prophecies that the next age of the museum um, will be the age of programming, he is embracing a performance-friendly context for museum participation. However, some might worry that he's also moving the museum, as other museum directors are, toward the same experiential service idiom that informs so much else in our lives right now the service training of the rental car employee, the conversational banter of the tech support system, or of the hotel receptionist, or the hospitality and aesthetic of the biennial caterer. The museum, along with the hotel and car rental company, that sometimes seem to occupy the same plane other post-Fordist cultural laborers uh, occupy, those who understand themselves, ourselves, to be marketing experiences, encounters, and to quote this event's promotional material once again, activities without end product that actually end up advancing a totalized experienced economy. Oh, there she is doing very material work so we can have an immaterial encounter. So this is to acknowledge, I think, that thinking about the way that we perform now is embedded, I think, in some minds with this broader, sometimes uh, anxious question of the landscape of social labor more generally, especially um, in light of, say, workerist or post-operismo schools, um, school of Italian theorists who have chronicled these supposed turns turns from an agricultural labor sphere to an industrial labor sphere, and now to the supposed service labor sphere that we occupy. But I think it should be acknowledged, acknowledged that this supposed turn looks different to those, of those who have been revising traditions of the performing arts fields than it does, for, say, for those who've been revising traditions of visual arts. 
Um, for those who descend from the dancers, singers, opera singers, actors, the corings, the touring troops, the actor managers, the stage managers that populate theater, opera, music, and dance history, the creation of affect and the design of experience has been central to our and their very long labor history. They've been coordinating affect and experience long before any post-Fordist moment. Other artists may have been making objects, activity with end product, but the history of theater, dance, opera, and music is in part a very long history of activity without end product. Indeed, that's precisely why Marx turned to these performer laborers with such perplexity, and why people like Paolo Verno and Michael Hart recall these immaterial makers to understand the nature of affective and material labor now. But at least let's notice that those who descend from the performing arts fields do not experience this turn in the same way, that they've been in existence long before the experience-based economy discovered them, and also might happen to feel that their practices have resources beyond those that reify the society of the spectacle or that capitulate to totalizing social production. Indeed, the specter of such capitulation notwithstanding, touting its threat can also seem like just another way of harboring quite old, modernist, anti-theatrical prejudices under a new rubric. Okay, so having done some scene setting um, around the ways and the we's and, and what it is to think about performing now, I also want to try to have this gathering be somewhat functional here now on May 26th to 2012, and as we approach the closing of the Whitney Biennial, which has, itself has generated so much interesting conversation and debate. It seems to me that this is also a year, even if I'm on the academic calendar, where there's been a lot of other debate around other key signature moments, including interested response um, to Performer 2011, uh, from uh, Roberta Smith, Claire Bishop, Andrew Horowitz, uh, Gia Curlis, Claudia LaRocco, Katie Manson, and many others. There was a symposium sponsored by Culture Bottom Under the Radar called Black Box versus the White Cube. Martin Spanberg report, report, reportedly annoyed and inspired artists and critics of all varieties by talking about this as a moment of a lifetime. Um, uh, people at the Walker Art Center are trying to figure out what it means to be collecting Merce Cunningham's costumes. Fusebox Festival in Austin has been trying to relocate the conversation entirely. In Los Angeles, everyone was up in arms around Marina Abramovic's ensemble, and varieties of people were helping that ensemble trying to figure out what they were doing at that much um, vetted, if not exactly vetted, donor event. So um, there's a lot of conversation going on and a lot of gatherings. Um, and so what I thought I might do, and this is my first pass at this, is try to get a sense of um, what some of the key sort of uh, uh, tropes are. What are the habits we have now about talking around this? Um, what are the occupational hazards of occupying and we could say swapping contexts across art forms right now? Uh, and again, these are also a first pass and to some degree overlapping and contradictory, so I invite your critique. But first of all, and I think very generally, if, we, if I can go with, I'll do a top 10 occupational hazards of occupying the performing institution. Here we go. Uh, the disciplinary barometers affect our inter encounters with interdisciplinary art forms. When I first started to make this kind of art argument, I used to say, medium Medium specific barometers affect our encounters with unmedium specific work, but then theater and dance people began to ask me what medium specific meant, um, which was, of course, to say that I had unwittingly made my own point. Even if we claim to be interested in hybrid art making, the forms that we have experienced will, will affect how we gauge the innovation of a cross arts experiment. It will also affect what reference points and what vocabularies we use or don't use to compare it what traditions of interdisciplinary artworks we might remain blind to because of our own artistic uh, itineraries. So for me, there's a real disciplined nature to our interdisciplinary um, conversation sometimes. Furthermore, once we try to get a handle on knowing more about what we don't know about, the frames which we, with, um, which we, which we, which we try to create um, conversation can also create their own exclusions. 
especially if we end up in situations where there's a kind of binary frame that produces new kinds of blind spots. So even if we take this notion of the relationship between the visual arts and performance, we can realize that there's a huge amount of heterogeneity reduced and rendered equivalent by that opposition. The casualty is then that when that heterogeneity is reduced, we have a limited conception of what the different traditions and movements within forms might be, and different points of connections across other forms and within them, and also places where there might be more conflict. So for instance, dance right now is actually enjoying a special kind of incorporation in the art museum in a way that we could say theater is not exactly in the same way. And we won't be able to get a sense and get deeper into a, a conversation about why unless we notice that that word performance is risking sort of homogenizing differences amongst um, different kinds of performance forms. Similarly, visual art is a baggy and largely unhelpful term for the enormous variety, for enormous variety. Painting's relationship to action or environment or to flatness will connect the dots or disconnect the dots to performance differently than those that will connect it or disconnect it um, to the parameters of sculpture. I think, too, of even the symposium to which I referred, that black box and the white cube, as a way of binarizing the visual art and theatrical trajectories. The opposition might keep us from noticing the specificity of the history of the white cube within a longer, not always white, history of museum display. The polarization also um, reduces the specificity of the cube as a sculptural form, whether white or some other color, as a specific object that tried to open the door to other modes of self-conscious, performative engagement with the viewer, a kind of openness that actually plots a relationship to performance. Meanwhile, it under-notices that the black box, that category, is a form of theatrical space that reacted against a theatrical proscenium. The black box is not equivalent to theater, but a variant of theatrical experimentation. And of course, that opposition, white cube, black box, won't track the different associations and projections that might be at work when the black box becomes a figure for cinema, which will be, have a different set of associations. So the shorthands are always helpful in trying to do these conversations, but it's also, you know, it produces new exclusions that I think we have to sort of watch. Um, and I'm sure everyone here watches out and is strenuous and vigilant about all of this. And so, um, so I don't mean to be um, school marmish about it or hopefully teacherly. Um, but it does seem to me that once we um, remain committed to exploring and enabling cross-arts experiment, it's interesting to begin to notice anew the places where, say, a cross-arts experimentation has already occurred. So often it's, it seems to me that the deconstruction of one form often ends up involving the reconstruction of another form, whether self-conscious or not. This is the kind of thing that one begins to notice when one takes a work that has been measured from one barometer, say from within a visual arts or within dance, and think about what it means to measure it from a different barometer. So, for instance, while I delight in analyzing Andrea Fraser's insti institutionally critical interventions in the space of the museum, I can't help but notice that the traditional theatrical conventions um, are also employed as well. A costume, a script, the creation of a persona. So on the one hand, Fraser is dematerializing the visual art space. On the other hand, and from the perspective of someone like me, Fraser is also acting. So some can end up being suspicious about the appropriation of one form in order to stage the disruption of the other, and some might be even more suspicious of the fact that few people notice this re reuse. Innovation to some can look like a reinvented wheel to another. I always try not to use an example <laughs> on this one, um, but let's consider gently, if we can, something like dance critic Gina Corlaus' uh, critical response to Michael Clark's Who's Zoo. She wrote at one point, for one, he forages deeply through the costuming and movement language of Merce Cunningham, even showcasing one of his former dancers. It's awkward to watch such repurposing of the Cunningham aesthetic with its skittering feet, impossible balances, and quivering muscles under spandex. So we might take issue with this critique, and I really more put it forward as a kind of ex exhibit. Because um, we seem to have there a situation where one set of eyes is seeing the reproduction of a tradition, 
where another pair of eyes may, not, may have assumed innovation or invention. And Kurilov seems particularly to be objecting to the idea that this repurposing won't be registered to those for whom such movement is new. So I think of it, um, I'm dating myself, but um, when NBC would run the reruns for Friends, the Friends shows, they would say, um, it's new to you. <laughs> and so it's, a, it's akin to that notion, well, <laughs> it's new to you. Um, so indeed, this way of articulating the hazard of swapped context has, I think, become more persistent in the last year of critical response as critics and viewers and fellow artists are weighing in with more intensity about what they see and what they don't. I myself tend to phrase the problem in these terms, too. And I join people like David Levine sometimes who wonders why bad theater ends up being received as good art, as well as why good theater is often received as bad art. Or as Andy Horwitz said in one of his pieces, why the visual art world considers so much theater laughable. So this is you know, touchy, difficult territory, I think. So I think it's worth going a level deeper in this discussion about good and bad, innovation and repurposed tradition, and also to think about being clear about how elements such as execution and concept, amateurism, virtuosity, skilling and de-skilling actually might have a more complicated cross-arts history. So to invoke a term that was used in the artist space um, propaganda for today, virtuosity. What happens when virtuosity as execution of skill meets virtuosity as the execution of concept? I know it seems very basic to, to review this, and I, and I realize that I'm creating a new binary. But at the same time, it really does seem to me that tussles around, the, around this relationship are key toward understanding why differently positioned viewers and art worlds will find the same work beautiful from one angle and lame from another, conceptually rigorous from one position and like the emperor's new clothes from another. Depending on one's answer to questions around virtuosity, concept, and skill, Virtuosity can look like a capitulation to totalizing social production from one angle of vision, or like the interruption of that totality from yet another. So while they use different labels, all varieties of 20th and 21st century art forms have had their conversations around what might be called a conceptual term. To be brief but productive, we can generalize and say that the so-called conceptual orientation on art making focused on decentering the execution of identifiable skill, whether skill was understood to lie in the stroke of a paintbrush or in the height of a leap. In order to focus on the art object or the dance piece and art event as an exploration of an idea instead. In its most cynical form, this is when art put itself in quotation marks, provoking, in less cynical reading, a critical form of reflection on the parameters and definition of art itself. Within different art forms, there became growing suspicion of virtuosic skill as traditionally executed. The internal critique of these forms and the critique of their relation to social systems, economies, and culture industries needed to happen in an environment that sidelined the appeal, the pleasure of virtuosic skill in order to focus on artistic encounter off of, with the idea, with the idea of movement, the idea of task, the idea of exchange or objecthood of the body, the museum, the studio, the theater, or the screen. I think we end up, though, in some difficult territory when such conceptual pursuits partake of experimentation across forms. Without more solid immersion in the trajectory of conceptual practices that got us all to different points, whether conceptual visual art or minimalist dance, post-dramatic theater or expanded cinema, we might actually have different ways of deciding where the idea is and where the skill is. When is a piece appropriately understood as virtuosic in, say, the lay sense of the term as execution of exceptional skill? And when is a piece appropriately understood as virtuosic in the sense forwarded by Paolo Verno as immaterial cognitive virtuosity in the conceptual sense? And what happens when rigor in the conceptual sense of virtuosity looks amateur in the lay sense of virtuosity? Can we be inspired by the quotation mark effect, asking us to think critically? At the same time, when do the question marks, that's 
sort of, I'll place question marks around the form, seem not to provide enough. Indeed, when a conceptual turn seems to be rationalizing the fact that certain artists never learned certain skills in the first place. So this brings me to another difficult moment, um, another ha hazard that, has, uh, that I'm calling it uh, for the moment hijacked de-skilling. The history of de-skilling in conceptual art and performance occurred when artists trained in a variety of forms actively masked that skill, marshalling a series of conceptual questions in order to interrogate and perhaps explode the art tr traditions from whence they came. They, this actually can be hard to do, hard for a, a, um, Jackson Pollock to do, hard for Yvonne Rainer to do. But I think we end up breeding distress when we find that those internal critiques of virtuosity used to, might be used to celebrate work that seems to others mediocre. Said Claire Bishop in a recent response to um, a performer, one has to acquire training in order to reject it. A formulation that may sound odd until one thinks of the number of ways that critiques of virtuosity in one context might be hijacked to rationalize experimentation that does not have to make itself accountable to the form it says it's rejecting. So I'm not going to show an example here. This is, you know, uh, you know, sort of difficult, I think, territory. Um, but I, I put it out here in part for you to come back and critique and uh, tell me what I'm missing. But I feel like this is happening a lot. <laughs> Um, we can say that the reverse situation is also a hazard. In a landscape where we might have different barometers and tolerances for gauging the relationship between virtuosity as concept and virtuosity as an exceptional skill, we can also find that a new exposure to some techniques and forms might look suspiciously virtuosic, like capitulations to older traditions of art and beauty, precisely because maybe I don't know how to do it. So while unfamiliar conceptual forms can appear curiously unskilled in some contexts, they can also look egregiously virtuosic, too good or beautiful in that older sense, too good to have any conceptual rigor. Indeed, some forms might look suspiciously overskilled. Certainly, this suspicion shatters, shadows some of the conversations around performance in the museum, especially dance performance and dance performance perceived as beautiful. Uh, at a gathering that I hosted at Berkeley called Making Time um, last month, Sabina Rietweiser acknowledged that in her conversations with museum trustees at MoMA, part of what appeals to them about this trend in curating is the idea that beauty and skill are being brought back into the museum gallery via performance after so much conceptual art disallowed it. So that makes it suspicious. <laughs> that makes it suspicious to some, and perhaps we can talk about the possible misrecognitions and missed opportunities that befall any context that capitulates to it, but also any context that might be too quick to reject the possibility of alternate beauties and alternate uses of skill sets that might make a critical intervention. If the homogenizing of heterogeneity and in performance has meant that too many understand performance only to be itself when it is live, spontaneous, unrehearsed in every day, then we find not only dance people, but theater people needing to explain why some of their interventions might need rehearsal. Consider Richard Maxwell's statement in his Whitney, about his Whitney experience, and it almost seemed to me that he needed, he almost, almost as if he was having to apologize for his need to articulate the alternate rigor that comes from rehearsal. Quote, rehearsal is getting used to the idea of repeating, he said. It feels more honest to say to the people that are going to watch a theatrical production, look, we know we've repeated this. We're not going to put any energy into pretending that this is the first time it's happened. I think about rehearsal as a way of reckoning with the fact that we're going to repeat. I feel like repetition also has something to do with being the best you can be. It's something tangible that you can master. I don't know if I can defend that. Maybe by saying, we can do it, so let's do it. Let's master that. Again, rehearsal and mastery can sound suspicious in a context that is worrying about beauty and skill being smuggled back into the art institution under the guise of performance. But we can also back up and be suspicious of the suspicion, asking if there is a binary opposing the 
conceptual de-skilled tradition of visual art to the virtuosic but presumably less conceptual tradition of dance and theater that might be creating new blind spots of its own. So earlier I said, I asked why this kind of cross arts conversation might be happening now and with a different framing and urgency than it might have happened before. In acknowledging that it seems to have something to do with the threat of this post fortis labor context, bent on affective and immaterial totalized social experience, I think that we can also acknowledge that a huge part of why all these hazards seem to matter is that they are occurring in a power field. Indeed, they're being worked out in an apparently asymmetrical power field, one where donor dollars, collector interests, ticket prices, union rules, and the availability of day jobs all seem to swirl in an anxious mess. In this mess, we find ourselves the enduring the experience of what many see as the provincialism of the seeming elite. This is a way that some have a sense that certain powerful institute organizations can position themselves suddenly as discoverer adventurers, even as they pluck what Claudia LaRocco called blue chip specimens into the curatorial vision, or fly pre-anointed British bad boys from one context to another. When that habit is paired with another habit, that is the offer of a performance commission to the friend of a friend who sat next to you at dinner, <laughs> some cry foul, feeling that whole reams of practice and generations of performing artists are being pushed to the sidelines despite the apparent gesture of incorporation. And of course, once one is offered the chance to swap contexts, especially in one where the new context is perceived to be more powerful than another, one might not necessarily find that the resources and know-how provided match the status of the space. Do installers at the art museum have any sense of where to store props, direct lighting, or provide performers with a way to go to the bathroom? That's, I think, thinking about those things are why things like um, Wu Song's green room or um, uh, Sarah Eccleson's dre uh, dressing room are so interesting as art forms. But this kind of frustration seems to be exacerbated by a pervasive sense that there's a power relation between visual art worlds and performance worlds, and that it's asymmetrical and not always reciprocal. Claudia, sorry I'm quoting you so much, Claudia, <laughs> says that visual artists aren't jostling for recognition at dance space to the same degree that choreographers might be hoping for a spot at MoMA, or that Guggenheim would never ask Sarah to paint a painting, although they might now, even if the performance world might be chasing after Matthew Barney to get him to make an opera. Um, to some dance and experimental theater artists, there's a sense that visual art institutions and celebrity visual artists occupy the powerful, totalizing, donor-driven, speculative sphere, sphere. That seems to be, to some, where the power is. But of course, from their angle of vision, visual artists also understand themselves to be part of a critical history that distanced itself from the all-powerful culture industry, the culture of the celebrity more readily associated with the brainwashing function of the performing arts fields. So there's this sense here that power is always elsewhere, somewhere else. But it, it it's always seems to me that it's inevitably going to come booming, boomeranging back with the recognition that power is always here at home. Even in discussions now about crediting, about how we understand divisions of labor, um, how we understand divisions of labor within the ensemble of a, of a performance ensemble, who's the lighting designer, who's the set designer, etc. Rather than you know a, a different language of who is collaborating with who, who um, who is um, uh, who gets credit for uh, being the lighting artist rather than the person who did the lighting for the performance. You have this sense that there's uh, sort of different occupational categories that are in the process of redefinition. Um, but that sense that the grass is greener, or the sense that its greenness might mean that it's artificial turf, fuels finger pointing that might keep many of us from noticing the larger issue. And that is that economic concerns around live art are embedded in larger questions of how artists can stay alive. Older forms of jealousy amongst fellow artists can become exacerbated as one learns about the economic models of other forms and wonders about further corruption. Artists who never sold documentation suddenly are. Artists who never sold tickets to experience their work suddenly are. 
Are you selling out more if you sign up at the gallery or if you decide to choreograph a gap ad? But it seems to me that economic distrust, cynicism, longing bespeak a much larger question about the economic models that will sustain culture workers of all varieties. The subject that I also understand to be one that will drive at, at other gatherings here at this space. And my hope would be that the question we are asking today might be joined to the questions you were asking in those forums too. Only then might we extra extract ourselves from the distress and cynicism doled out on each other and join in a shared discussion about how such finger pointing keeps this cross arts context swapping from being a new opportunity to imagine cultural labor together and perhaps more imaginatively. Indeed, each of the hazards that I listed above, I think, contains within them another way to be or to think or to question. I think it's useful to try to imagine the same work from the headspace of another, to measure its distance from forms that are different from the ones you habitually, perhaps even unconsciously use. Even if I worry about the hijacking of the de-skilled discourse, um, I also ask my students and colleagues to think about the effects of the quotation marks. What happens when a dancer's moves are defamiliarized by being placed inside a gallery's cube? Or when theater's conventions of realistic acting are made into an endurance performance on the gallery floor? And what happens when the defamiliarization happens in the other direction? when a dancer's moves frame, quote, and tilt what we think a museum is. Finally, all art forms have their celebrity artists distributing opportunities and resources that in ways that might feel inequitable and sometimes without logic. But sometimes there is a logic. And sometimes um, we can also come together to talk about how we perform now and how we might perform later for each other and for a future that keeps artists and artist experiment alive. Thank you. The artist will continue to do what's essential. This is a remark Jill Johnston made in April 1968 in her indispensable, indefatigable column, Dance Journal with a Little Choice. She's talking again about Judson Dance Theater, a topic that concerned her, consumed her almost as much as her own revolutionary self and rampant revelations. She's complaining here about the stupidity of crowds and how money traditionally gets poured into ash heaps when the phoenix has risen elsewhere. She stops herself, saying, a wider public may also be a pointless issue. Having said what's on my mind, I can just easily cancel the thought. The artist will continue to do what's essential. It's a statement that comes into my head often when I'm thinking of today's phoenixes working against their own kinds of ash heaps. I'll add that I find phoenixes everywhere, and I think the ash heap itself can be its own kind of interesting sandbox to play in. It's also a reframe that seems particularly apt for a place like artist space. One of those original alternative spaces that's all about artists doing was essential. I'm not even sure how to begin except to note that Sarah Mitchelson is one of those artists who continues to do what's essential, working against those productive constraints, lack of money, lack of space, general philistinism, whatever, using the tools she's been given. And she uses all the tools, choosing to work exclusively in a recognizably dance-based idiom, 
even when many have given up on or upgraded Danza's basic premises. Even when she herself upgrades these premises, she always does so in Danza's own terms. As far as I can tell, and now like after your talk, I actually think of many other, there's a lot of directions this could go. I'm going to reveal many of my own blind spots. Um, as far as I can tell, there are two essential premises, impulses really, that have animated the field of dance in New York City. Maybe all over, I'm hardly an expert in the past century. One is the increased efficiency of something called technique, which is really a form of habit, a structure, or rhythm for working. The work of Merce Cunningham is exemplary partly for its incredible attention to the nurturing and development of technique, which could be used as ballast for explorations in the body's shape and range of motion and capacity for endurance. His company, as you may know, disbanded at the end of last year. Recently, his school at West, at West Beth in the West Village. Hope that dancers of various stripes for 42 years was shuttered. I think the impact of this closure cannot be understated and will continue to be felt, or not felt, as the case may be, in the dance world at large for years to come. I can think of no more essential, both accessible and rigorous, touchstone for New York dance artists interested in the strange alchemy of technique than Cunningham. The technique will live on, classes will continue to be taught at New York City Center, but it is no longer the living technique it was, and its influence will, I'm guessing, be quite different. The other impulse concerns the democratization of dance. Democratization's positive valence, as practiced and extended and consolidated by the founders of Judson Dance Theater some 50 years ago, for those of you who don't know, we're now celebrating Judson's 50th anniversary. It's been a while. Um, Focused on the juxtaposition of everyday gestures alongside specialized ones, and the employment of any old wonderful bodies, to use another Johnstonism. This was also dance in a dialectical relationship with tradition, dance that worked outside of dance, but still within the idiom. In its most profound applications, it expanded the vocabulary of movement that could be considered dance, and the kinds of bodies that could be considered dance bodies. It erased some boundaries and reasserted others. We, we inherit from its founders very little technique in the traditional sense, though, even as I say that now, of course, there's Trisha Brown and Steve Paxton has contact in the so that's contestable. But more of an uninhibited rethinking of the pitfalls of hierarchy and institutions. The Judson version of the avant garde continues to exert its creative force today, both in the work of its original founders and then the generations that have followed. Meanwhile, the company model, seen as so crucial to the building and maintenance of technique, loses ground. After Cunningham, and in the wake of this historicized avant-garde, we find ourselves in a strange situation. Of course, it doesn't matter what I say. The artist will continue to do what's essential. Some, like Miguel Gutierrez, have enthusiastically formed non-institutionalized bands of peers, in his case, the powerful people, a mutable coalition company for the new world. Others, like Hamlet Young, have abandoned their formidable technical training, traditional staging syndromes of dance and theater, and now work their charisma in response to the economic pressures of New York. Young has left both the company model and the standard rehearsal model. So she still rehearses, but in her living room at home, and makes solo shows she can hawk on the road, i.e. the festival and university circuit. Then there's Sarah, who works outside the company model, but who I think takes technique very seriously. As many of you here know, Sarah was something of a signature artist for this year's Wiki Biennial. Her piece, Devotion Study Number no. 1, The American Dancer, was not only the inaugural work in the Biennial's performance program, it also won her the Buckstrom Award, which is the big prize given to an artist in each edition of the Biennial. The Biennial's performance program, which consumed some two-thirds of the Whitney Museum's fourth floor, was a beautiful experiment. It put the performing arts front and center at the heart of the museum, a gesture that ended up valorizing the museum as a hermetic, totalizing space. The work that transpired there over the past three months both looked back, emphasizing the unique, brutalist architecture of Marcel Breyer's utopian building. Utopian is also, perhaps, brutalist. Uh, and forward, anticipating the Renzo piano design, performance-friendly building of the Whitney's future. The piano building will have its own theater, an exciting addition, perhaps, though I hope the dance and theater artists will continue to commandeer the gallery spaces. Dance, after all, wasn't born in the proscenium, nor should it always end up there. Ballet was, born, was not born on an elevated stage, for instance. It originated on the unforgiving floors of the palace, the plaza. We make all this stuff up as we go along. And it reminds me of Sarah's very rarely worked in the proscenium, preferring 
various type spaces that can be dramatically retooled and reconfigured to suit your needs. The Whitney's recent experiment is a natural evolution, exemplary if not necessarily out of the ordinary. Museums are not made for dance, but plenty of dances have been made for museums. Cunningham's first ever site-specific event was commissioned by Vienna's Museum of the 20th Century in 1964. The Judson protagonists made museum-friendly and university-friendly dance. Yvonne Rayner, Trisha Brown, and Lips and the Childs all made dances for the Whitney Museum's exhibition spaces in the 70s. Um, Dia Beacon continues to commission and reprise dances from earlier generations of choreographers. And Lucinda is actually an interesting person to bring up, too, because I didn't mention her in my review, but she did a piece at the Whitney in the early 70s that I think in its repetitious qualities might, it, it, it recalls what Sarah was doing. I think it's probably, it's very different. There's a very different impetus, but I know that Sarah has, she has her eye on Lucinda in general. I think that's always been, she's been somebody that she's quoted in the past. In dance, as in any art world, I suppose, we're seeing fundamental shifts in traditional infrastructures. The weakening of the, of the company model is attended by the expiration of certain financial supports. This year, for instance, the Greenwald Foundation, a long-time stalwart in experimental dance and theater funding, killed its humanities program and is now channeling its money solely, solely into bioethics. Dance makers are looking for alternatives or energy sources to plug into. I guess they always have. On the other hand, the status of museums is also in question. They compete for resources with major collectors in unprecedented ways. Museums, as Shannon pointed out, are becoming more event-driven, responding perhaps to a desire for visitor numbers, diversified audiences, hype, the experience economy. It's hard to say exactly what. Basically, dance is looking for infrastructure, museums are looking for programming, it's as easy as that. But dance isn't cheap, and to date, no one has satisfyingly reconciled the economy of dance and visual art. Money, the perennial crisis, is the big question for future programmers, and we'd all do well to look to museums with long and ambitious histories of commissioning dance, like the Walker Art Center, which appeared several times in Shannon's slide. Indeed, the Walker was the first museum to commission work by Sarah. Her daylight from Minneapolis in 2005 took over not merely the center's McGuire Theater, but also its galleries, room, entrance, etc. The Walker also co-commissioned Devotion, a brilliant exposition on themes of creation, pastiche, publicum, premiered at the kitchen in January of last year. Devotion was a strange work that contained trademark image books and ease. She retooled the kitchen's familiar black box space, flipping the stage clockwise so that the audience faced west rather than the usual south. This is a technique that she also used with her, in her piece Shadow Man in 2003 at the kitchen when she flipped the entire theater so that people coming into the theater were, so that she, she and her dancer, um, or co-dancer, walked in together from the street. So you can see them on the street again. Um, she also, in devotion, she also used um, portraits painted by T.M. Davy, making the subject of the dance world's mythologization of stars. But she also advanced new agendas, using text written for the occasion by the playwright and theater director Richard Maxwell, in this case, a lofty epic lyric poem reworking biblical narratives of creation, Genesis and the Birth of Christ. There were six main dancers in devotion. Three of them, Rebecca Warren, Ellen Rickleman, and Nicole Manorino, who was projected on here earlier, uh, were trained dancers. Their skills were different, but their movement was clearly, unthinkably virtuosic. The two men, James Tyson and Jim Fletcher, were either untrained or trained in other performance fields, in this case, theater, and I'm not actually sure what James also has theater training, but we can ask Sarah about that too. Then there was Don Griffiths, a young woman, um, I think 14 years old at the time, at a crux age. Her partially trained body rode that intersection where the harmonious inflections of technique compete with the awkwardness of puberty. Griffiths, who played Mary in the Biblical Schema, animating devotion, was as much a subject of the dance as she was a character. Her frog moves, gawkily elegant in form, was still figuring it out were as much about dance as they were examples of it, and her juxtapositions with the other trained and untrained or moderately trained dancers in the work underscored a relationship to technique that seems to me fairly uniquely Sarah, as much as you can all say it, something's unique. Um, in this vein, I also recall several moments near the end of the dance when Jim Fletcher engaged in an exhaustive, dramatic gymnastic dance with and against the athletic Eleanor Houlihan, 
lay down and counted his pulse as she leaped over him triumphantly. Devotion was astounding, partly with the sheer amount of phrase work in it. On the other hand, Devotion Study Number 1, which ran March 1st to the 11th on the fourth floor of the Whitney, was built entirely with phrase work using the original Devotion. In particular, it devolved on a single piece of choreography, a circle pattern made up of four backward triplets that occurred only briefly, about an hour into the earlier piece. Devotion Study Number 1 involved a continual perversion of the triple triplet form as well as seemingly endless permutations of the circle. And with a few small exceptions, these circles were the sole movement performed with the five dancers in the 90 minute work. Devotion study number one was virtuosic, or I think it was. It had its own unique logic, its own criteria for evaluating virtuosic. Here, a dancer's skill was not necessarily contingent on his or her level of training. The dancer's order of entrance and exit correlated with their ability to hammer out the circle. Sarah talks about this ability in terms of the dancer's naturalness with regards to the movement. This isn't to say that training didn't matter or that it didn't register in a dancer's carriage, ability, capacity for endurance, etc., but it was not in itself a determining factor. Most anyone could do these circles, but to do them well required single-minded perseverance and a skill set that transcended any easy model of virtuosity. How do we account for this virtuosity? And to what extent was this virtuosity governed by something we might call technique? As with most Sarah dances, not all the dancers had formal training, but each did the movement as best they could. It never looked easy, but in the end, everyone came out looking good. Technique wasn't essential, but it wasn't written out of the equation either. I still wonder, too, what it means to rethink virtuosity in the context of museums, the museum being a paradigmatically modernist institution, and thus one with its own investments in medium specificity, the technical support, etc. What does it mean to consider virtuosity in the world of museums? was devotion to study number one to museum-specific dance. Sarah first came to New York as a scholarship student in the Cunningham School, but she left before joining the company and never joined one after. Technique is in her DNA, but she's not beholden to a specific method of training. I wonder if this lineage helps her see the value of bodies with different capacities and constraints. I also think it has something to do with her milieu, this ability to see the value of different bodies. The post-company world of New York contemporary dance, in which performers of various stripes talk and mingle and hire each other. It's a freelance free-for-all, a group that survives by tapping into an unruly and unstable mash of resources, including a museum. It's generative and debilitating, impossible but rich. And as the bond between museums and dancers strengthens, I wonder what they'll make of each other. This is, of course, like, I think, the overarching question for you. How are we going to understand each other coming from various fields? The energy of current dance in New York lies in the struggle to make sense of this fertile and hostile landscape. It is not the excitement of a single constant innovator like Cunningham or of a moment crystallized like Judson. It's the excitement of a feverish, perpetual migration of the diaspora, a diverse group of intelligent misfits building something for themselves and thus for us in this antique, hyper-networked, can't pay the bills. History already happened, so now what? Spectacular time. And with that, I'd actually like to invite Sarah upstairs. I'd like to ask 
first, actually, about your, your relationship to the Whitney and how it differed from, say, your relationship to the Walker, which was sort of the first museum institution that you worked with professionally. Okay. Um, okay. So, well, when I, when I went to the Walker, I was invited by Philip, who, incredible guy. And, um, and actually, I didn't know him at all. And he was a, a, it was actually, strangely, actually, coming full circle, it was a party after a big Cunningham shot bam. And Joe Valillo, and, is that funny? Um, Philip there, and Philip said, um, oh, I want to talk to you about, would you ever do something for like a whole building? And I was like, totally. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know who he was or what he was talking about. But I was like, yeah, I'll put him totally. And then, and then um, so that became his commission for, it was kind of slightly unclear that old building was closing the old walkers and in order for them to build a new person in the Mirror building. And, um, the next thing that happened was I was invited to the closing party of the old building, which I'm, well, I asked Phil, and I was so glad that I saw that alone before I saw the two buildings together. And then um, tons of stuff happened. Like I went and met Paris of the Mirror, and I went to Basel and blah, blah, blah. But, um, and this was the, in 2004 or so? Yeah, when I went to Basel, it was 2004. I got a PowerPoint presentation about um, the vision of, what's her name? Kathy, the lady who designed that? Christine. Christine, yeah. yeah. So she gave me a, um, a presentation of, about, that became completely informative about what day it was gonna be. Anyway, but well, you asked me what was the difference. The difference is that I was invited by Philip, who was a performance curator for this, he said the whole building, but he really was in charge of the theater, and there was like this idea of like, I was gonna use local kids, I had all these ideas of blah, 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 but actually, as Kathy knows, it wasn't necessarily completely easy. I, I definitely, I went into the museum from the performance department, and so I had to negotiate how to be in the wider museum, and I had to have a meeting with Kathy. <laughs> about how to do that. Um, so that happened, but but I, it, even though all of that happened and that was the first museum, there was a familiarity that I had. I had this kind of like, I don't really know how I did it now, but I had this kind of big, bold confidence about performance and coming from like the theater and da da da. The Whitney was different because I was being curated into a visual arts Form the Whitney Biennial by visual arts curators. And there was no theater, no knowledge of theater, really no knowledge about that a dance has to drink water. Like, you know, some really basic, no, you know, how to, you know, building a floor, dinner, table, like there was a whole lot of stuff that I was responsible for working out and creating budget for. And, um, and so it was intimidating in the Whitney and the, like, the Walker Art Center was huge and probably one of the most um, um, moving things that I've ever made, actually. Um, and I took over this whole building and it was like, I couldn't even believe I did it. <laughs> <laughs> After I was like, fuck. But um, just performers like on the roof, yeah, yeah. at the courtyard. It was, it was everywhere. nuts. It was really nuts, but I, but um, yeah, it was a real love act with like 50 local kids and these women from the community. It was like, it was awesome. I mean, it was really hard, it was super stressful. But it felt very um, supported from inside. The, the institution somehow, I think because of Philip and Philip's relationship in, his, in the institution, it got a bit rocky, but it basically felt on some level, you know, not to me, but to the institution. But being the first person on the fourth floor in the Whitney, it was really super unknown and intimidating in very many ways that weren't just about, am I gonna fuck up? <laughs> did, you, was, did you have this dance in mind before you came to the 
the Whitney or before the Whitney came to you? And the Whitney came to me like, I think it was like less than two months after Devotion closed, not until Devotion tour finished, so I didn't have anything in mind. Uh -huh. I was still like getting back off tour and Prudence, my child was two then, I think, jumping out of our crib one and a half. So. And then, so it was like maybe it was six weeks after they came, and I was like, in okay, how many months? You're kidding. Like, no, I can't do it. But then you did. I did. <laughs> I totally did. Yeah. I guess, what was, when you go into a space like the galleries, you knew it was going to be on the fourth floor. No. They um, came to my house and said, I it was really convoluted, like, we're curating the biennial and we really like devotion. It wasn't clear if they wanted me to do devotion in the biennial. I think they didn't know or, and they we really like devotion and there's this thing about your work that has kind of, your real, well, this was especially Jay, you're really aware of context and legacy and they just gave me all this material about performance that had happened historically in the Whitney and I was like, guys, I can't, I'm gonna, I can't do this, I'm gonna fail. And I, I see what you're giving me and I, people just walked into the galleries then in those days and it was really a smooth, you know, that is really different now. And I would be lying to you if I said I can make that happen. I can't, I can't do that. Um, and they were talking about the, um, the second floor, which is where most of the performance happened. It has a wooden floor um, and blah, blah, blah. And then I went on a site visit. And on the site visit, I, when I was at the, of course I've been to the Whitney a million times, but never thought about myself in the Whitney. So it was a completely, the site visit was a completely free look at the museum. So that's interesting actually. Been in there, I don't know how many times, many, many times, but when I went in there thinking that I was going to do something, that was a different look around. <laughs> but um, when I got to the fourth floor, I was like, guys, it's this floor. And then they were like, well, there was this exhibition with a wall here, and I was like, no walls. But then they did it. I, that's why, <laughs> then, I couldn't believe then they actually did that. And then, when it opened, I realized, I didn't really, really understand the real estate of that until <laughs> opening it out of there, and I was like, ooh, <laughs> this whole floor has nothing on it except me. It's weird. <laughs> really, until it opened, even though it's in there, you know, yeah. That was really interesting. <laughs> Yeah, I felt sick, but it was too late. It doesn't matter. <laughs> you can't stop. <laughs> so, I'm curious, so you had, you had to negotiate also this time when you weren't performing. And I think that's an interesting quality that you have to figure out with museums. Or, I don't know, you always want to figure out with museums, but it's certainly in this case. Yeah, like... You had to, you had to, there had to be something there. Elizabeth, in particular, was extremely worried about that. And I, now, I didn't, at the, at the time, I was like, oh, shut up. But then, once it opened, I was like, duh, yeah, hello. There's busloads of people in here. <laughs> <laughs> Wondering why performance was um, Anyway, yeah. Um, but I very quickly realized that if we were going to do an 8 o'clock show, like at the Kitchen Devotion, we all showed up at 2 at the latest. So I'm like, okay, so that's six hours. So I was like, oh, so we just show up then. That's what we do. That's, it's just, that's what we would do. It's not like we could do something somewhere else. So we, in that way, it kept it simple, but it was grueling for the dancers. That, you know, there was no, there was no privacy. There's like a behind, for the times when there were tears, which there were tears um, from all of us, I think. It probably, possibly, except James Tyson didn't. Shed tears. <laughs> but I think everybody else shed tears. Um, or maybe Maggie didn't shed tears. I don't know if she did yet. Yeah. So I think for the times that there were tears, <laughs> for the times that there were tears behind the risers, there was a little alleyway that they had to keep open because it went to the um, uh, what are they call the people who maintain the art. The animals. Or the what? Yeah, the conservatives office was right there and so there's and so we would all be like huddled on the floor on the stone floor like crying as if the conservatives would come out and be like are you okay do you want a chair you want to come in our <laughs> it's important you know it's not just bathrooms where you need a place to cry yeah. yeah yeah i mean not always but <laughs> <laughs> more so with this dance than others this one devotion also needed places to cry um I don't know, I can quite a few of them.
dog is like that a voice like that. <laughs> Partner less. Are you still designing for the right? 
Uh, not anymore. Uh, no, not really. But she I worked mean, on. She, she worked, worked on the Beach. Yeah. Yeah, Parker and Mike and Greg. Yeah. Yeah. That was was so was Dover Beach the last dance I had? Because you worked in various iterations. With Greg. With, Greg and Mike. Greg Mike. And Mike was in Dover Beach in Cardiff and could it was with do Gats, I think, or do something with the RS in when we did Dover Beach in New York, and so Greg replaced Mike. Yeah. Um, I want to talk a little bit about <coughs> the model of virtuosity you set up, or I am, and that comes out in Devotion City Number One, which is it seems like I mean, you have these different bodies, they're trained in a different way. And actually, can you tell me what James Tyson went because he does have some sort of. He's here. Do you like to answer? <laughs> <laughs> what do you do? He is a. a Sharon, he's a, he, calls, he, he used to be called a programmer uh -huh. of performance in Cardiff, and that's why I met him. And he writes and directs and acts theater, he sings, songwriter, and now is a dancer. He's become a dancer. So, yeah. But when I first met him, he was going to maybe replace Mike Ashley because he had been a part of the, he'd been there for the programmed curated all this set, Dover uh, Beach Cardiff, and um, so I thought he could maybe replace Mike, but actually, he, he tried out for a little bit, and he couldn't, I thought, he thought he, that I can't do the step, so he was going to be the horse. Uh -huh. And um, so, yeah, as he's now going to be able to do Mike's part, that's what I thought, and then, um, but. Dover Beach was, it started out as a dance in 2009, 2008, 2008. Um, Nine in New York. In New York. And started out as part of in Wales. James Tyson brought you over there to work on it. And it had a, an iteration there. And then it came to New York and premiered the kitchen yeah. in New York. And then here, this is the backstory. Um, so you have these different bodies. I mean, you, you can also tell that Maggie, for instance, is trained. She was, um, she had a white maid part in Devotion State number one for those who saw it. But she was more ballet. You can see that there was, I think she was a recent graduate from Juilliard, and she was like a very ballet trained dancer. Eleanor and Nicole, it seems, have their own kind of style of training. But everybody's different, everybody's coming from these different. And I wondered how you work with them when you're having them do essentially the same exercise. I mean, it's Oh God, that's, you know, we're working on that again now. I don't really know what that is. I have, I think that you're picking up on something where there's this very fastidious work that is, um, yeah, really based on information about the body and what you're doing and how you're doing it, and it's super specific. But, um, and, and somehow everything that is between anything that is completely task-based and known by me or us is removed. And so we keep working on the task, and the more um, precise the execution of the task becomes, the more clear it becomes that kind of um, individuality you're talking about. Um, I'm not necessarily pursuing the individuality. You're just a merchant. Um, yeah, I'm a vessel. No, um, I, <laughs> I'm. Um, but I'm really interested in ideas of uh, authorship in a stringent, hopefully honorable fashion, not to be to be not lazy about that, and and also um, understanding kind of I don't know the desire to dance, who we are, why we're doing movements, and therefore what are the movements, and why are we doing them like that, and what's the difference between doing it like that and doing it like that, and so. You know, we spent a long time just doing a triplet, and now we spend a long time doing something else. But there seems to be a lot of information there, yeah. and in that information is a a stringency or a yeah, and and a, there has to be a, a huge body intelligence. But as you say, Non has a huge body intelligence. James has a huge body intelligence. It's um, and then there's a technical. Ability that sometimes is helpful and sometimes is adversarial. Like it's, 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 it's adversary. Sometimes because I think that the the, the it it um, 
Jennifer Howard where it can very quickly um, remove itself from presence through through virtuosity or like through through problem solving. Right. So um, the technique offers a way of getting from one an escape to the court quickly. Yeah. It makes yeah. something easier. That's like possibly, or it's maybe not easier, but there's a there's a way out. And so sometimes it can be. Gives you the shot. Do you? I mean, do you prefer or do you have? I mean, do you, what is your experience working with somebody who has a certain kind, I mean, who has technique? I know there's many different kinds of technique. Oh, yeah, somebody who's yeah. a great dancer versus a non-dancer. Jennifer Howard is a great example of that. So she was in Dogs and in Daylight in Minneapolis. And I met her in White Oak when I made a dance with White Oak. And she had worked with everybody, like Feli Elp, Mother Feld, Twyla, Misha, obviously. Lucinda, um, I forget, but um, the it's very exciting to work with that kind of body. But there were, like I said, there were a lot of problems. I wish she was here; she could really talk to you about it. It was a lot of problems. Um, and, and actually, strangely, she would. This is a this is a, maybe a very strange thing to say, but she quite often would compare me to Twilight in this one way, this one way, where she said that we both pursued the difficult place in her, like that the, 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 the sh something about her making it too easy or her backing off and not her not being able to retain um, her relationship to difficulty or something. So I wish she could say it, I don't know, but. <laughs> so, I mean, I'm actually curious about, I mean, thinking about Twilight, what is, this is a really basic question, but what is your draw to dance? Like, what draws you to dance? You, you moved to New York to be on a scholarship with the Cunningham Company for the early 90s. So there was already, very early on, this kind of attraction. Yeah, like, definitely, I, like, I don't know, God, I mean, this, so I'll say two things. One thing is, I am, I don't know the answer, and I'm, I'm, we're, that's what we're working on now in the studio, is that what is the desire to dance? Where is it? Where does that live? You know, what is repetition in relationship to that? What is living in the end? That is a big, um, heartfelt question, so I can't answer the question. I can only say I share the question. And then on a more, like, really simplistic level, you know, I don't know, like I was, I remember when I was a really little girl with my grandmother outside in Manchester, like in some small town, I'd never ever seen ballet or anything like it, and I saw a picture of some ballet shoes and I wanted them. <laughs> and, I, you know, and then I danced around them. I, I don't know, like I, I think, it, yeah, I think that whatever, it's really done, but I think it's, I really think that it's a vocational business. Do you think, I mean, was there something? For me. Yeah, I should say. Yeah. What was what was it? I guess what was it like to work with? To what was Cunningham for you when you went to, <laughs> and what did you leave with? Why did you leave? Mm. Well, I remember. I, I don't remember at the time why I left, but I think I was just getting trashed. Probably <laughs> this is like I wasn't showing up for the class and I'm getting trashed, and I, you know I was young and. Then, angry, and, um, but I remember that I did say, Glenn said that I said to him, how many goddamn tilts are you going to do? <laughs> 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 he did say that, and he does tell that story. So I, so I guess I said that, <laughs> how many goddamn tilts are you going to do? And I, I don't know, like I had a very loving relationship with being there. I was there at a great time. Um, all who I was close to were, became in the company while I was there. It was all like the, the second company was kind of leaving slowly. It was all, it was really slow moving in those days. You know, you waited years to get it. And so all of a sudden, like five or six of my friends were in the company. It was like really exciting. And then I did a show my own work at the, at the studio and it was all very emotional. And, um, but I remember most would walk in on it and be like, fuck him. <laughs> <laughs> I now I can't believe I did that. But I was like, look, you can't even walk. I'm not doing this shit. Like, I, I remember feeling that way, but 
the truth of the matter is that <laughs> it's true that I did. And then, but, um, you know, when he died, I saw it for like three days. I really was, like, I, he, so, yeah. I, and I was surprised, I was called the phone, like, what's going on? But I think that I just felt um, some very deep loss of, I got some protection or something. I think I experienced that um, work as very protective of me in some way. I mean, I remember, I think I saw you more than just any other, like, dancer at every, I mean, yeah. both at the last events and, and immediately after he died at the Rockefeller Center and then for our Rockefeller Club. Yeah. You were at everything. <laughs> yeah, I felt very, yeah, like, like um, uh, yeah, like I wanted to, like, well, I'd already figured out that, you know, earlier, so since the day when I was like, fuck that, fuck him, like, since those days I'd already figured out that that, um, the relationship to, some kind of a relationship, some kind of spiritual, sorry, that's such a hokey word, but, um, quite, let's, let's just say quest for, um, sense inside the abstract and structure were in vast and vast space was had was in me and I knew that I had found that through being there. And so I had already figured out some love uh, before he died. I'm curious I I only have like a really I just want to ask another couple questions and then I want to open it up to the audience. But I was curious soon after so you went back to London or to the UK after you left first, and then you came back to New York and you found the community here in New York. Yeah, I went to the research right after I came back. You went to what? The research. research. Uh -huh. I started working there right when I came back. And I was curious, what, how different was that experience from working with Rose, or even that experience of, I don't know what we call it, that the movie research in downtown community, but how you, at the time that you entered, like how did that inform what you're doing? As the pathway, I mean, so I, I sort of went, it's for, basically from worst to just, I was right away working at Johnson Church, so I, when I came back, and um, yeah, I was just, and, and that, the pathway from kind of back to working in research, it is the pathway that I followed, like, in a way, it feels very clear. And I remember in a, in a recent interview with Gia Corliss, you mentioned that you know you think um, devotion site number one, and it's you know because formalism, like it's very strict formalism, is it actually recalls like your, your more punkish, reductionary early works, like other movement research. I mean, what? Oh, I see that. Could you speak about the relationship of that? I think I'm just yeah. I think I'm, I think I'm just I am. Um, I think punk is formal. I think that, in a way, you know, like I think I'm just I'm just one person, and all those things are equal to me. But I think that um, that punk was quite abstract, and and handled structure in abstraction in some way. So just to be totally, but I think um, okay. All right, if I'm gonna okay. So my my so and then my okay. <laughs> Movement research and the stuff that happened there and the work, the early work that I did there, that that it was experiential. I went all the way, all over the place, with myself, with many other people. I went really far into experiences, on stage experiences, um, and the work that I started to make was very embodied in that way and then moved, I think, away from that or from that towards structure. But without that work, the, the way that I understand the body would not be possible. Could you move? Or performance or risk or fear or that's why my work is not any I'm not as coming out. Right. My relationship to my dancers is very different. My relationship to what what the work inhabits, the context is really different. Yeah. I'm present. In a certain way, 
sometimes was quite absent, even in the studio, you know, like, and be present, of course, but like, yeah. I'm like, he was the master. Yeah. Do you think that without a company model, you can, do you think not having a company, would you ever consider having a company? No. <laughs> do you think that outside that company model, that that allows you to explore certain ideas? More I frequently? think that it keeps everybody involved free.
an assembly of the masses quality that that may or may not uh, be consonant with its aesthetic, with an aesthetic umbrella that you might put on it, or an aesthetic frame that an artist may or may not want to put on his or her work. So, uh, you know, I, I feel like it's also even interesting to think about it in terms of how it, what part of the museum, if it is a museum, what part of the museum organizes the event-based work and, um, and, and how something that might have, might have been formally, uh, you know, programmed by the, by the outreach person <laughs> is now being curated by a curator. What, 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 what's the tangle there, I guess, um, uh, in terms of uh, the real difficulty of, of creating, of uh, interesting, of, of creating democracy, <laughs> of, um, of and, and whatever you think that might mean in terms of access and in terms of um, numbers, in terms of public sphere deliberation, um, in terms of populist taste, you know, and a, a whole lot of other things start to come up there. And then what would the curatorial response back to that be? What, what, what would be the line that one might draw to sort of say, to still protect the artist who may not go with one version of what of, of, of what the aesthetic of democracy needs to be. So that's a somewhat long question. Why is it democratic in a hall? Yeah. I mean, the change is free, but I think that's <laughs> Once you think about sort of the status of the institution or the ticket prices, the access, the, no, the or what, yeah, all, or all even have any of that aspiration at all, right? Yeah. Maybe it would help if you compare historical examples to contemporary examples. I mean, like, why is it why do we talk about work that has been done now so much different than work that has been done in the seventies? Or when and we measure it slightly different. You know, like you don't talk about the work in the 70s about being populistic, sensationalist, yeah. and contributing to this back of the institution. But we do that if we talk about uh, Sarah or Michael's work and, and the everything. Uh, so why do you measure that in two different Well, I, could, I mean, I can sort of ask that back. Why do we have to, you know? I, why is it that, uh, that, that some of your aspects yeah. that cost support for this uh, yeah. to, to suggest that the exact plan. Sorry. Well, uh, well uh, I, I don't want to put this on Richard, but this was also me um, me going from the or whoever wrote the 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 uh, pamphlet the, the promo for the event. So it was, you know, in terms of coming here, I was trying to think, oh well what are people wanting to talk about or what how are people thinking about this? And I was wondering if that, that type of a frame, this notion of the fear of totalized experiential production, is that something that people are feeling more concerned about than that really wasn't an issue, wasn't a type of discourse that anyone would ever have put on, on work in the 70s. So I, I, I do sort of wonder, do, do people, is this feeling like it's a concern, that, um, that there's a particular pressure here or, um, or that this is one of the, you know, the frames with which people that people are using to process or raise concerns about it. So I, I kind of put it out there as a, as sort of a question. I mean, I guess you can only compare different works with each other. I mean, there's a difference between Sarah's, yeah. Sarah working in the context of the name, and let's say right. Marina Brambridge. Yes. It's, it's, you know, it's a two different right. works. Well, there's one kind of argument that that some could make, which is to say that um, if a lot of work from the '60s and '70s was in part, and uh, in, in part, certain one trajectory was in, in part to um, uh, refuse the object, refuse the sort of the creation of um, identifiable, pointable objects, um, that. That, and that, that there was a radicality in that gesture. Um, 
the, the, the sort of macro view that if you believe this argument in terms of how labor is, has changed, you could say that in an odd way, um, those experiments in the 60s and 70s were presaging service-based, a service-based sphere. Um, so in, in, the, in, a, in, a, in a way that a lot of art, artists are obviously you know, prescient in terms of what, what a new, uh, how, how life ends up um, transforming. But, but I mean, truly I ask these questions because I actually don't know that it's entirely fair to put the concern about um, the, the, ex, ex, the, the concern about the experience of totalized production on this work now. Um, and, but I, but I do hear, not just hear, I do feel that that's a concern that some people are raising about the participatory museum, the inclusive museum, the programmed museum, and that performance is, 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 is one vehicle for advancing that, which might be the case, and in another way also doesn't do justice to a lot of other things that performance might do and has done. Lauren, for what the museum might do for performance. Right.
great that people missed it. I think there's a great mythology. Well, I think it's, yeah, but it's absence. And like there's an absence for me. You know what right. I mean? Like, is that? Well, I know, I understand what you're saying, but when I talk about the movie Diane Dill, I did see your piece. A lot of people, and I can't really talk about my experience with the movie Diane a lot of people because they didn't see your piece. And that's very different than, you know, 90% of biennials, you know? And so I think that's just something to sort of take into account that performance should be the opposite. No. You get capitalism. And you can. But there's just this other kind of, you know, thing where you, you know, performance not only do you have to be in New York to go to the biennial, you know, so are you able to Asian and then do that certain time and have to get in, you know. So that's another, you know, to take consideration. These are not spaces that are built for this kind of, you know, <coughs> sense of in audiences. People are, the standby people are like waiting in the stairwell to try to get the show, which is a sort of awkward thing as eat the hats, walk past those people, you know. <laughs> I think the hats took the elevator. They did. <laughs> And, and of course, in the end, like, the warming up exists, is that also? And we 
worked with it in that way, but it was not um, some desire to do that. And I already knew Richard was doing that, and he also like to remember how to do that, Richard, and he worked for us, but like, you know. <laughs>
how much does it cost to build the floor? We think it's going to cost this much, and then how, where are we going to paint it? And the sealant, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And um, yeah, so there was. I was the person, pretty much, with the most knowledge, which is funny. <laughs> But you also do your own fundraising too. Yeah, good question there. You know, just question so what you were saying about the release of the video and somehow not having to actually the the other rock show or the other rock show the French rock and that stuff. Because it well I mean it's over since months we had the retrospective and the presentation in Barcelona. So yeah, it was really not only exhibitions about dance. So we have a moment where actually the choreographer, the dancer, is doing this retrospective in the museum. And what was interesting, it was the format of the exhibition because there were other dancing dancers performing the pieces. So there was not this moment of absence. It's not that nobody was excluded. It was just a question of temporality. How can you catch all those moments when everything was was like that? It was there in a way. And then there was a, a conference. The, the exhibition called Expanding Choreography. What was interesting was that all the questions that were related to the choreography was all the questions that were related a lot about performance. So it was like after, talk, after talking about performance for a few years, now we move to choreography and to dance. It's a kind of a, of a discourse that is moving from education to performance and then to, 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 to choreography. And it's always like, of course, the, the, the dancers are very much into economy, into labor, that's for sure, because also the way of the performance has changed. So, the performance has changed itself from the 60s and the 70s. And there is also, on the other hand, there is also, um, if you talk to the artists from the 60s and 70s, they are also happy in the way to be in the institution, that somebody is taking care now, and somebody is also including it into the art history. So, there are all those like interesting. Tensions and conflict are still going on and not really never like answered, like get to find definite answers to, to, to that. But I think this was an interesting example also the format we are using because the witness was a right to the gesture. So we are making the floor, but there are constraints. So we have to wait downstairs, not everybody can see, or everybody can see, but not maybe really understand me, but not really go to the, the, the whole, the, the total. So I think that one, the, because I mean, performance and dance are now part of the institutions, and like institutions now know that we need three rules, and something it's really it's there in a way, and it's of course it's important to question it, but it's there. So I think that somehow the and this is an open question also to 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 think how then we are presenting performance and dance in the institutions, like the different format that we can use at different forms. And I'm sorry, have you ever ever came to your mind to about the exhibition? Because now you were part of the exhibition, but your exhibition, you in the in the in the in our institution. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's, it's actually presented to you now at the Buxton Award. You had the opportunity to do a show at the Whitney. Is it something you've given thought for? A little. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I'm very, I think that I 
mostly I do it all myself, and I, um, with help, but I do it, and I think, and because it all, it all comes from what is at the heart of the dance. Um, it's not, none of it's decorative, and it is definitely, I feel, and I was saying to Eva earlier, I just feel that I'm in defense of dance in that way. It's a set, unless I'm a, I make sets for dancers, and I make dances, and, um, but it's nice that they look good, <laughs> or interesting or whatever, you know, but, um, but it is really, uh, when Lucinda uh, Childs was out in Berkeley last year, we were asking about the collaboration around on dance, dance the piece dance, that had the collaboration with Solowit, and uh, Solowit and uh, Philip Glass. And apparently, uh, she, uh, other people probably know the story, that Solowit, when he first, when she first proposed that he would do a, a grid for, for the piece, he, he, he was like, well, if I, I would just create the background for your dancers, you know? And he, and, and she said, oh, no, no, we'll be the decoration for your work. <laughs> As a way to get her to do it. <laughs> um, this isn't really fully formed yet. I think it's a question for all three of you, but using some of the language that Shannon you put forth. I'm stuck on the word incorporation when you're saying that dance is being incorporated now in the museum. Um, but also I'm thinking about your Ray Frazier example and, and the, would you say, occupying and crossing contexts of, of our forms and how um, and about that, that performance was legible as acting to some audiences. I know that's a broad word for you, Sarah. Um, but, um, so I'm just wondering how now the incorporation of dance is affecting the legibility of maybe not, you know, capital I, capital C, institutional critique, but some sort of an institutional address um, at this point. Well, it would, be, it would be cool if it wasn't just incorporation, and as all these stories are showing, the story from the person that is describing the Barcelona exhibit, um, you know, something else comes, something comes in, and, into a space, and the space is changed when that thing comes in, right? It's not that there is some, you know, wildly hegemonic incorporation that, you know, where I think you can neatly decide, um, you know, that that, um, that, there, that there's some perfect absorption. It does seem to me in that sort of more radical notion of dem democracy that there is a kind of uh, jostling of categories and challenging of different institutional structures that's happening all the time. I feel like I, I feel like I want to be a fly on a wall or something like embedded <laughs> embedded scholar in, in these in these conversations and institutions right now around these questions, how they're putting together retrospectives on this. Every single decision seems so interesting that every single conversation that people are having around it. What does it mean to collect performance and what is the collections person, and what what is the curate, what is the con conservator now think that their role might be <laughs> in terms of care? Those are just so interesting, and it really does suggest that it's not just some hegemonic incorporation by some people institution, but but there's a kind of uh, reconnecting of the dots and redefinition of different structures and categories that really might be underway. It really is underway, um, uh, and not to be utopic about it either, but. Um, reconnecting of the dots seems really possible and it seems like it's happening um, and it would be kind of staying sort of careful and imaginative about how we might want those dots to be differently connected. I, yeah, I can't answer that. <laughs>
in Oregon. And uh, I understand it's, uh, it's somehow an answer to a historical context. Or and the subtitle of the piece is uh, The American Answer. Maybe you could talk something about it. Um, I don't. I don't know that I exactly understand the question, but um, um, the the historical business is um, to do with arriving where I am, just being current currency. Um, I'm not trying to create a body. There are bodies there. Um, I, and I'm in some kind of, um, really, it's just really I'm trying to understand always what a dance is really, what it is to me, why, what, what is the power of a movement, why does that have any power, why does it have any interest, how is it an artifact, how is it pedestrian, how is it um, lauded, what is the relationship of spectacular performance to a movement alone. Um, so some of those basic questions that have been around forever, but my own um, quest and relationship to them, I think, is all that it all amounts to. Nothing so special. <laughs> It's a no go question. I'll keep it next to it. Thank you very much, David.